Yeah, so welcome back to the plenary session. Um, this is where everyone should be now. Uh, the rooms are, are now closed in the each individual uh, location. So thanks for those rich discussions. Uh, welcome back. This is now session six um, of seven, although these sessions are great together. So um, this is our final session of the day where we will um, where we will wrap up and report back on the last two group work sessions. Um, for me uh, and the discussions that I've been joining in the various rooms, uh, I feel really privileged to be with each of you um, today exploring these really critical issues for children uh, during COVID as well as future infectious disease outbreaks. I mean, we're hearing from colleagues in Sudan and Yemen and Albania and Kenya and all over this vast richness of experience and thank you so much for being here today and for sharing. So please know that all of your thoughts and um, recommendations and key priorities you've identified are going to be shaping the action and Iraq. <laughs> so I wasn't, uh, I wasn't com complete in all my, uh, um, all, all my listings. It's been wonderful to hear from everyone and to have representation from many places in the world. Um, so we have two group work sessions to report back on. And so I think we will dive into group work B. So first of all, we will have each of the facilitators report back on group work B, and then we'll put up the Mentimeters for the second group work where we move to priority actions. So we're gonna have to back up now and think about that session we are in for B um, on the socio-ecological framing and um, how all those levels connect so we're going to go back there and um, start with the first group. Um, can we start with the child? Perfect. Over to you, Etching. If, if you can lend me your glasses. <laughs> OK, uh, thank you, Laura. Um, <clears throat> I'm really struggling to read. That means I need to see an optician soon. Um, may I get help, please? Yeah, it's true. The font please. is quite quite light next to the white. Um, some of the key yeah. priorities. Uh, sorry, this should be group work. Yes, okay, group work B, okay. So some of the priorities identified for the level of the child, we're mobilizing community leaders and a rapid response team to reach out to children. Um, monitoring through peer support group, um, peer group support and child forums. Um, starting with assessment, so psychosocial, economic needs, listening to children's voices. So going beyond participation and really listening and taking into account. Oh, thank you. Mobilizing community leaders and response, um, building capacity and working with policymakers and NGOs. Um, so really working with children's and youth clubs. So looping uh, government, health and education sectors. So here we have the need for intersectoral engagement again. Do you wanna take over there where you see it bigger etching? Um, community volunteers and hotline to identify children in need of support, speedy access to accurate information, identification of people who can influence behavior change, identify the relevant channels to communicate to children. Several points in that. Um, Ensuring ch children, con children consultations at the onset to have a child-centered approach. Continue child protection monitoring using both remote and face-to-face -face throughout the pandemic. And importance of upscaling joint advocacy with the government. And I, if I may add other, other stakeholders. Sorry, it's, oh, there we go. It wasn't letting me click away from that one. <laughs> mm. 
We need to ensure ongoing protection monitoring during COVID-19 through disseminating hotline numbers in zones up to in zones um, of up-to-date referral mapping. Another learning is to have local persons who are trained on receiving and supporting children. And those are, I believe that's all the ones we have for you guys. Oh, okay. great. Thank you Thank so you. much. Um, so a real theme of ensuring the participation of children engaging meaningfully, not in a tokenistic manner. Um, any other final thoughts from, from the group, Aching? Um, none, unless the group members would like to add. Any group member that would like to add a point or two? No, we'll have to go on to the next group, I think. Okay. Great. Thank you so much, Aching, and the group of the child um, for those insights. Okay, we'll go on to the next group. Um, here we have government. Judy, welcome. Okay, so this was um, a good discussion. We had two groups going at it. And so uh, definitely a theme was around proactive awareness, raising with government officials on the impact and um, on protecting children and, and really using the evidence and, and stories from children so that they really understood what was going on. And then there was a discussion around the focus on an interministerial advocacy so targeting finance and justice and other different um, government departments on the priority issues, which would be education and uh, health and really integrating that in. And then to engage at every level of the political ecosystem to incentivize politicians and policymakers. And one, someone said in one group, you know, for helping politicians realize that the children will become the people who will be voting in the election very soon. So that that was really critical. Maintaining a focus on children and human rights can focus on the Convention on the Rights of the Child and that governments have ratified this and work from that lens. And a, was a good discussion on including marginalized and excluded children because we know that there were a number of children and groups that were missed and making the case for them to protect them. So we're protecting all children. And then the last one was mainstream, mainstreaming child participation in all advocacy and not just tokenism. Thank you, Laura. Thank you so much, Judy, and the group who worked on the challenging task of thinking what nations <laughs> and governments should do around protecting children in future infectious disease outbreaks and waves of COVID-19. Okay, and next group is the family. Welcome, Elena. So I think I'll start by citing the uh, CPMS standard 16 and that says in infectious diseases outbreak the ability of caregivers to provide responsive care can also be undermined by measures used to control the spread of the disease such as quarantine or isolation. These factors can expose children to family conflict, negative coping strategies and other forms of violence. I think this is quite a good summary of like what we have been through over the course of uh, the last nine months, <laughs> all of us. And if I could just uh, see the results like from the Mentimeter, I'll just list the priorities that were discussed like within my group on one side and uh, one shows in French, but I will translate for you is the strengthening of the communication system to ensure that Families, caregivers have the right information uh, so that they are better equipped like, to protect children. 
and uh, uh, that uh, communities are then uh, more welcoming like to this information. Um, then there was a recommendation, which is also all of them are super important. I wouldn't be able to prioritize them for sure. We could have added more uh, to this, but um, um, I'm so. <laughs> It's the strengthening of the capacities are, sorry, I'm just gonna go like without the highlights because it's uh, confusing me, but uh, um, for me, it's important that um, we highlight the priorities set Mama Group as uh, the second one being strengthening community approaches in reaching the most vulnerable families um, who might not be necessarily feasible, uh, for example, by reaching out through faith leader or community leaders. An example of these invisible, uh, more vulnerable families could be separated families who do not necessarily maybe have access to cash support or support to uh, female added household and single parents of different kinds. Another topic that was discussed quite um, for quite some time within the group is the um, support to mental health and uh, psychosocial support of caregivers, which I think uh, is key in these response and in the response to any infectious diseases outbreaks. When, where uh, if I cite Lucia, where basically parents are often parents or caregivers more generally are, are asked to take on more roles than or more responsibilities than than they do normally so the increased uh, stretch of capacity there is key to reading this recommendation. And then finally, um, strengthening the capacities and resources of caregivers in their roles. So, so how do we equip them uh, to be better prepared like to face all of these uh, uh, challenges uh, should this arise again? And I conclude here and I thank my group because it was lovely to speak to them and to hear from their experiences in the field. On to you, Laura. Stories, how we're strengthening community-based approaches and strengthening capacities of what's already happening um, and really looking at how to build on those protective mechanisms, whether, whether they're informal or formal um, support systems for children. Okay, so now I'll move to the cultures and sociocultural norms. Welcome, Sylvia. Thank you, Laura, and hi, everyone. Uh, I'm going to try to represent well my group. We had like a really, really nice discussion with a lot of contribution. Uh, so as them, like as priorities to protect children during future waves of COVID-19 and infectious disease outbreaks, looking at the level of social cultural norms, uh, we have uh, six recommendations. So what we've been discussing about uh, community-based mechanisms and how we've been using uh, before COVID-19 formal and informal structures and how now is even uh, more needed. They, they need to engage more like community volunteers, uh, which uh, seem to be more culturally acceptable. And then a priority uh, for building the capacity of, of these community volunteers or um, religious leaders uh, that are already uh, in the community and one of the gaps would be like to provide that uh, that capacity building uh, to these groups. Uh, we also discuss about like